This afternoon, Bob the Needles, um, get a bit of needle pulling to clear it out a bit. It was, there was more on the ground than there is on the tree at the end of it. There was quite a, a bucket of needles came off it, but just to clarify the image a bit. Um, bit of a backstory on the tree, it's probably about 20 and a bit years old. I've been growing black pine for a long time, uh, badly I might add. Uh, so I've got lots of material that needs to be, that needs the problems that they have in them resolved by thinking a bit outside the box. So occasionally you come across a piece of material and you think, oh, I don't really know what I'm going to do with this. And so um, I had two identical ones. This particular one here was planted initially in the, sort of there in the pot as an upright. There was another one here and there was one there. I had them in groups of three. And usually when I start planting black pines in multiples in pots, it's because I'm getting to the end of the potting run and I'm absolutely sick of putting one to a pot. Last week I potted up 325. Uh, that was from this season's batch. And you just get sick of arranging the roots because you want them to be reasonably good. So whenever you get any trees, you know, like if anybody ever get any trees off me and there's multiple uh, trees in the pot, I was at the end of the run and it was getting very close to beer o'clock. So I just think it's just fist planting, you're putting two and three in and four and five in. This particular one here was, there was two identical uh, of trees. Two of the trees died. And subsequently over the years, the trees were sort of growing up and the one in the middle that was alive uh, wasn't supported as well by the dead trees as I hoped and slowly fell over and then grew along and just became, so it comes out of the ground and it goes absolutely sideways. The roots have died off and like quite a long time ago. The other tree uh, I did as a demonstration, it was not as, not as, not as much volume in it as there is in this one here. Um, and I did that earlier on in, uh, a few months ago. And um, the big problem is planting them when they're this extremely, um, you know, it's got to be rafted or, or, how it, or, or you know, semi-cascade or cascade. But still, when the roots, when the tree falls dead sideways and goes along the ground, it doesn't give you a lot of scope for your conventional cascade pots. We'll deal with that later on. But um, so because they look like they're going to be a bit more of a problem outside of your conventional um, uh, like planting and styling or whatever, you just leave them and they sit at the back of the place on a bench and then some other things grow over them and they miss a drink and a few more things happen. The dogs jump up on the benches and run around and you get a dog trying to bury bones and things like that. And so they just get lost. So 20 years go by of the thing growing up out of the other stuff and then one day you have to clean up, uh, which is, I have a clean up at my place every 20 years and a shower every 10. Um, and you find stuff. And, and you go through and stuff that looked was, you know, was only as thick as your thumb and had no character at all, all of a sudden it's got a bit of character. Now this particular tree here is all dead down, the, down there and that's just sunburn. Because I'm up in hay and, that, uh, and except for this last summer, we'll get 45s up there sort of consistently in summer. And even though they're rough bark, there's only so much direct sun on the bark at sort of a, a 90 degree angle. Uh, that they take before they, they just burns the bark off them. And so over the years it's rolled up and there's a bit of character in the lower part. So it's sort of, you, you look at that sort of thing and you think, okay, there's something you can build on that. Always putting a triangle on any piece of material is not hard. It, the hard thing is having good nabaris, uh, good um, trunk flare, good taper. Uh, all that sort of thing is the thing that's hardest to, to manufacture and make it look natural. You know, we've all gone on digs and we've all, I mean, it's a bloke thing mainly, but blokes, it's the, the equivalent of a wheelie. A bloke will go out and the blokes that dig the biggest trees, you think about it. Uh, so you, you have to, you can dig really big stuff up and all the rest of it and it looks impressive in the pot while it first fluffs up, but realistically it's going to take a long time before you actually get a good taper and a more realistic um, sort of view of what you're trying to miniaturise. So growing things up is, allows you to engineer every part of the thing. But occasionally you come across a piece of material, it's got one or two nice characteristics, but the rest of it's pretty awful. But if it's the top stuff, it's easy to manoeuvre around it, especially pines. You can bend the hell out of them, you can tie them in knots and do all sorts of things to get timing right. Um, I have these two trees. I uh, did one and then I got rid of it. I'll do this one here tonight because I think it's at a stage now where if I leave it another two or three years away, this is not going to be any better. It's not going to have any more potential than it's got right now. If I do something with it now, in two or three years, it'll actually look quite reasonable. Um, so that's why I chose this particular piece of material. Um, 
It will be a bit of a wiring exercise. I hope you like sitting through wiring exercises. Uh, anybody who gets bored at wiring exercises is quite welcome to come and help. <laughs> All of a sudden, nobody gets bored. Uh, nobody gets bored. But so I'll put a little bit of um, I'll put a bit of wire on this thing here. And we'll start sort of uh, working which branches we're going to keep. Quite a bit of this tree is going to disappear. Um, will I discuss the planting angle? Well, the planting angle is going to be. That's the planting angle. The biggest problem with that planting angle, it's going to be a, a dropped tree. So straight away, the first thing you do with any tree that you're designing is you actually have to, well, first of all, we are trying to depict a scene in nature. So where would you find a tree that would be on an angle like that? Well, it'd be up the side of the cliff. Uh, it would be wind, snow, rain, you know, horrendous elements. Um, and that would, that would shape a tree initially, you know. It would have initially tried to grow up and then eventually just fallen over bit by bit by bit until it basically fully cascaded. So if you take into consideration that you are going to grow a tree in the cascade, as, just like if you were going to grow a broom style, you'd look at the elements that would actually address uh, what would cause that. Well, once you do that, especially with high mountain scene trees, you have to expect a lot of dead wood because the elements are pretty extreme. So, if you, so, and this, not only just the, the way it comes out of the ground, but when I looked at it from that angle, that made more sense. And the fact that it's got a lot of dead wood here would mean that you'd have to marry that image throughout the whole tree. Uh, because if you don't, it's a bit like when you see those massive junipers, and I've been very, very fortunate in my life, I've got to travel a bit, and I've seen some of those junipers with the massive um, sharis and and you know, all that sort of the horrendous elements that the tree would have had to put up if they get into these big old, and then they put a lovely, perfect mushroom on top of it. And that really gives me the shits when I see stuff like that. And Quentin's, he's infamous for it. And I told you, I'm talking about it, but he's coming around, he's coming around, but yeah. But you know, look, you've got to, yeah, whatever develops this will continue. You know, we're the only ones who make our trees mobile. Nature sort of keeps things in the one, except for today, keeps them in the one position. Today it moved everything six inches to the left, but yeah. So, um, so there will be dead wood through the tree, which means that anything that's removed off this, certain portions of it need to be ginned. Now there's not enough hours this evening to gin everything, but we'll get everything sort of into a rough spot, and then we'll sort out uh, what can be ginned, or what will be kept for ginning. The other thing is too, that ginning at this particular point has to be done over the next few days or within the next couple of weeks because the material is all alive at the moment. So once it's gin, um, I can actually still bend the dead, what will be the dead wood, into the more corresponding positions. Whereas if I leave it to dry out, so even the dead stuff will need to be positioned down the track. But um, for now, I'll wire the live stuff. So. Um, Don, what sort of pot will you put that in and turn it down? Well, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I have a little something to show you, Zarp. My other, the other things that I do other than annoy the crap out of everybody um, is I play with cars and I do a lot of fabrication. And when I looked at the thing, and I did this for the other tree as well, I made a container for it. Now, this container that I made, it, can anybody here weld? Does anybody in this room know how to weld? Tom? Okay, fantastic. Are you a reasonable welder or a crap welder? Crap. crap welder? Good. Crap welders can do it. If you're a reasonable welder, you can do it really, really well. I'm a crap welder, but I'm an unbelievable grinder. So I, I, I mean with the... Careful, David. I don't mean you. I mean just the angle grind, you, an angle grinder with a flapper wheel on it will make the worst welder look amazing. Now I buy my flapper wheels 200 at a time, if that gives you any idea as to how good of a welder I am. So I manufactured something specifically for this, and I manufactured a similar thing for the other one. So, but I'll show you that after this is actually um, relatively completed. So um, having said that, can I get some help uh, here, please, Mr. Valentine? You all know Quentin? Yeah. <laughs> He considers this his um, working with the disabled. He gets extra <laughs> points. He reckons he's going to heaven because of this. <laughs> he's got no chance. 
the actual process is being hell. So. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got to go through hell to get to heaven, so yeah. Ah, uh, okay. okay, okay, yeah. There, there, and... Well, I'll do, I'm going to just take some stuff off initially, which I know is going to be um, gin down the back. Um, I'll just take it off now, and that way it'll also get it out of the way so that when we're wiring, it'll be a lot easier to manipulate around. Ginning, ginning is when um, ginning is when you've got like a live piece of material, okay, and then and then it's you're going to take all the bark off it, you're going to take all the foliage off it, um, sorry, man. and you're going to turn it into what it's going to be turned into dead wood. So it's so that you can actually depict maybe a, a harsher like uh, environment. You know, on one tree, you have a tree that's all alive one side, say it's windswept or windblown, and the side that's being exposed to the elements all the time is getting thrashed and thrashed and thrashed. So it dies naturally. So what you do is, in an artificial sense, we save the stuff that's on the downwind uh, consistently of the, of the tree, and it grows in the protection of the dead wood. But what you do is you cut all the stuff off, and then you get a set of, maybe a pair of pliers or whatever, um, and if you do it when you're first engineering it, when you squeeze the bark with the pliers, it just comes off really, really clean. And you get that, what they call uh, gin. This is a gin. That's a shari. That's called a shari. Where it goes down, the, it's, uh, this, this part of the trunk here is dead and been exposed, it's been sunburned like mad. The new stuff, well, the, the candy may is rolling up around it to, to heal from there, but that exposed wood um, is just called shari. So, uh, and what you normally do with that, what I should have done with that earlier, is lime sulfur. Uh, there's lots of preservatives you can use, uh, but because the tree's never been styled to this stage, I haven't bothered. It's just been ageing and weathering. And, now, once I've picked a path to the tree, which we're doing tonight, uh, I'll have to start doing that sort of maintenance. That's the other thing with me too. Once I, once I figure out the style I want the tree to be in, and it gets styled, even the first couple of stylings, after that, it's like reading a book. Once I know what it's going to end up like, I lose interest, so I'm, I'm hopeless. So basically, I just grow trunks and starter material. That's Honestly, my, in Japan there are guys that just grow trunks, there are guys that then take those trunks and put the fluff on them and do I'm the bloke who grows trunks. I used to like trees, like to develop them, but like, you, I can't maintain a big collection of trees. And I had a big collection of trees and it, it was just pointless. And if you don't maintain them, they all end up being stale material in any one. So, yeah, I just cut out the middle man. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think what I'll do is I'll print it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so. Oh, yeah, I'll see it down here. Yeah, let me need to go. Let me need to sort of go along with it. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah because I'll hit it. I'll just reckon. Because it sort of mirrors that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I reckon that, that'll come out there. So, and that's from there, so yeah. 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 Actually, yeah, but it's all right. Yeah, yeah, I want to present that. And I've got... Doesn't everybody carry one of these necklines? Yes. Ideal for picking noses. <laughs> Did I say that out there? <laughs> <laughs> you know that mechanism between thought and speech? It's broken. <laughs> uh,
Right, so how are you guys working out the size of Y you need for the branches? Uh, yeah, yeah, rotate that way, yeah. Uh, usually, look, the best way, thank you very much, good question. Shouldn't have to come from the president. There's enough people here to ask that sort of thing. Laying back there, trying to be entertained. What you do is, the best way to determine what wire to use, you have to understand which branch you're going to wire. First thing you do when you're wiring a tree is you're going to wire all the thin bits first. Because it's easy to put the coarse wire on before you've got all the other stuff uh, wired up and, and starting to position it. So you put the coarse ones on first, um, and the best way to do that is to feel how stiff the branch is that you want to you want to bend. If it's going, if you're going to bend, say. So we've got our tree, we're going to wire the tree. You're going to wire all your thicker branches first, all your trunks and your main branching first. The best way to determine what wire to use, if you're a, uh, a copper wire user, it's a whole different sort of uh, approach because copper wire's got much better holding uh, abilities. Well, I can't get copper wire very easily out where I am, um, so I can get this stuff here sent to me, no drum at all, aluminium. So you, what you do is you flex the branch to a degree not an every time, because after a while, after you've wired a couple of trees, you'll get to understand um, roughly how thick the thing is, what time of the season you're going to you're going to be doing it, and if you know that it takes X amount of pressure to to bend the thing, when you pick up a piece of wire, you'll bend that, and you'll feel a similar sort of pressure, or maybe more resistance, and if there's more resistance, ideal because it'll actually hold the thing in the in the position you want. Um, it's usually the best way is to is just by experience. The other thing is too that always, not all pines are the same. I've grown lots and lots of black pine and some are quite flexible and others, the same age, same day you go to do it and they're a little bit more carroty. You might get you might be able to get them so far and then they'll snap, which is a great thing to hear, especially on one of those branches you want to keep. Um, so yeah, it can be the, how, the turgidity of the plant, how, how frequently it was watered, uh, whether it's very, very active, whether it's been grown slow, so if you know the material, yeah, it, it's, it's more about um, always a piece that you're going to take off, flex it. Anything that I cut off this tree here, it's going to be the same flexibility, but all the branches that are that thick of the whole tree are going to be about as flexible as one another. So the wire you'd use on that would be the same all over the tree. Anything going up a stage will be about the same no matter where it is on the tree. Uh, and yeah, so that's really the best way to do it. Try the material, flex it, and then correspond with the wire. Nothing is, you've got to have wire. The number of times you'll do workshops, and there are emails, not emails, there are um, flyers before the workshop. Workshop coming up this June, uh, bring them on the tree, uh, make sure you've got a turntable, make sure you've got scissors, make sure you've got the wire, the, all the rest of the stuff. You know, I do, I've done literally hundreds and hundreds of workshops. And I'm yet to be excited at walking into a workshop and find people prepared. Nobody pre-wires anything, which means that you don't get a finished job on the day unless you're a really, really good wire and get it done. So you do yourself a favour by doing a little bit of pre-prep and make sure you've got enough. Make sure you've got more than you need on the day because you'll, you'll use it down the track. And this stuff, uh, I've got some wire at home that's 34 years old and it hasn't gone off. It's not soggy. Like we discussed, <laughs> doesn't go off. So yeah, so it's not wasted. You don't lose the. And if you do get the shits and decide you're going to leave the bonsai, bonsai world, you can bequeath it to somebody, or you can sell it to somebody. Or yeah, Quentin will take it. Yeah, I'll take everything. He takes everything. Yeah, <laughs> it's got his own van. I didn't realise. Pays to be bent. See, so I can actually get around in there. Okay. I'm going to run it out here because we'll probably use a bit of that.
what John, uh, what Don was saying about um, we are doing workshops. I know I've had a few chats to some of you guys about this as well. You definitely got to have a turntable. I was um, tutoring four people yesterday. Not one of them had a turntable. Mm. Not one of them had a, a chock or a wedge. And there were some big trees there. So when they plonk them down on the table, they go to spin them and all the table cost to spin around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do bring it, do bring turntables to workshop. So much easier. Sorry, girl. <laughs> so, Don, how about how about do you have a favourite species you like to work on, including any deciduous trees? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Look, I love deciduous trees. Um, it, it's as a where I'm in the bush, so we haven't got woke yet. So we've still only got bulls and cows and rams and sheep. Um, <laughs> So um, we're in the deciduous season, the, when the deciduous trees drop their leaves, it's like when a lady gets a gear off, it's fabulous if you're a bloke, and if you're a girl, it's not supposed to be a bloke gets a gear off, but ultimately <laughs> all sins, uh, all corsets, they all go away when the leaves come off. You get to see whether or not that lovely silhouette is made up of perfectly uh, positioned branches. Which there is no reason why that shouldn't happen with the deciduous tree because they bud like mad. The only reason you'll find deciduous trees that have got really crappy branch layout is because you've got lazy growers. Now you might be the person who gets the tree after the lazy growers had it, but there's no excuse to live with that. Right? You can resolve all that. I grow parodia. Um, uh, I would like to be able to show you a really nice one here that I sold one to Quentin and he got rid of it and he'll never get another one off me. And you wouldn't believe how good the parodies are I've got at home at the moment. I've got some, they are spectacular. I'll send you some pictures of the ones you can't have. Um, yeah, yeah. But seriously, they're the best ones I've ever grown. I've been growing them for 30, 34 years. Um, they're really, really nice. Uh, and they're raw. They're, they need to be styled. They're desperately needing to be styled. What species was that done? Parodia. Parodia. Parodia persica. I got them off Ted Point and I've probably told everybody this story once or twice. I was at Ted's nursery back in 94, something like that, 93, 94. Um, yeah, 93, 94. And he used to have a workshop night. Um, every Monday night you'd go there and you'd do lessons. I used to come up and uh, once a month I used to come to Melbourne for Caribbean Gardens for the trade days because I had a mate who had a nursery and I used to come and do runs with him. And anyway, we'd go to the nursery and, and just, if we helped prep the slates, we got to sort of sit in on the lessons. And um, Ted was a mad propagator, like a really, really good propagator. Um, and so I learned a lot of Ted over the years. But he, when I'd get there, he, we would never sit in on the thing, but he'd give me some of his trees to work on. We'd trim a bit of this. So I'm pruning his parodia um, group. He had a parodia group, he had a single parodia tree, and it's the red edge one. And so I pruned this tree this day, and he said, I want to keep the cuttings, can you put the cuttings into the water, and then I'll prep me out a pot of soil, and a bit of IVA, the Rutex powder, whatever, dip, and strip the leaves, and that sort of thing, and did that. At the end of it, I had a pot of these things. He liked a lot of cuttings in a pot, they grow better in communities, so Vine did exactly what he said. And I loved that tree, like, I used to see it in spring, and I'd see it out of leaf, it was an amazing tree. And anyway, um, I did the cutting thing and I said to him, look, I'd really, really like, is there any chance I can, you know, get some cuttings? I'll just spend an hour and a half pruning the tree. And, I, and he goes, oh, how many cuttings are in the pot there? And I, I counted them all up and I said, oh, there's 32 cuttings in the pot. And he goes, you can have those if you like. I went, really? He goes, yeah, yeah. He said, they're a dollar a cutting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, I'm serious. I paid him. $32, I got the cuttings. He wasn't doing them commercially. He said, oh, they're too good to have to be spoiled, you know, to sell everywhere. So he only ever used to grow a few here and there. So I grew them. 
Uh, four years later, I had 600 of them in the ground at the front. Uh -huh. I'm a pretty good propagator as well, as it turns out. And um, I think within 10 years, I was selling them to him. And he wasn't paying a dollar for them, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Women scorned and bent people. Very vindictive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, but I owe Ted a lot. I, you know, he taught me so much stuff. Um, never, never go into a revolving door with Ted. <laughs> yeah, no, no, a good, good guy. Yeah, good guy. So, so what makes you like the Paradia so much? Ah, uh, okay. Out of leaf, magnificent. Uh, they have good tracery of branches. It's, it's foliating bark like the plane trees. Um, they used to be a... They used to be a shade tree, in, believe it or not, in the car park at the airport at Tullamarine. Mm. There was before they started tearing them all down and putting up the multi-story things. Mm. Parodias were uh, the they're only a smallish tree in that. There's a couple of massive ones. There's a place called Four Winds Nursery down the peninsula. It's right up in the hills up near Arthur's Seat, I think, down that way. Um, and there's some mature ones there, and they flower and produce seed. I've been growing these ones here for years and last year and this year is the first year that they've flowered the ones in the thing but they haven't had it's only on the ones that had no trimming mm. so they so the leaf is uh, on the average about that big the outer edge in spring is bright crimson and the inner bit is a chrome green and when you see 300 meters of them at the farm like in rows because they have quite a few <laughs> It just as soon as they pop in the spring, you'd go out to the farm just to look at them. It was like, yeah, they were just magnificent. They do everything well. They propagate well. Like they strike quite well for cut. Take massive root reduction. Um, you can thread graft into them if, you, if they if they don't put a bud out where you want, which they do. They do everything. They do everything you'd want with a deciduous tree. Um, only they've got a nicer leaf. They don't. They don't flower. I love the plums. There's a plum there, and I actually said to David, who we were walking past, I said, that's a hell of a, an accomplishment on the day like today, a plum tree with any petals left on the flowers. I mean, after the day, that, is, that thing must have come into flower in here. That's been here since the last meeting. That hasn't seen any outside duty today. But they look magnificent. You can grow them into a nice shaped tree, uh, good leaf, not bad autumn colour, but you grow them only for the flower. But most deciduous trees, it's autumn colour you're looking for. Well, the parodia does that as well. So it's got a few things. And when they are old enough to flower, the flower's actually quite interesting. It's very, it's almost like hazel. Uh, with lots of little stamens with little red tips on them. Fabulous tree. But again, you know, my favourite tree might be somebody else might think he's been smoking that stuff again. But yeah, I, I really like the things. I think they're, um, and they, they just don't get used enough. We don't see them. They used to be down at Waverley when Ted was down there. Uh, you'd see them at the Waverley shows a bit, but yeah, I, I think Doc Koroshoff had a couple in her collection. I've seen many years ago. Lee Wilson had a fairly recent one, and Lee's came from Ted's on one of the trips, on one of the trips he'd done up here. I think some, probably three so there, I think. Uh, is three years? Yeah, yeah, about You had yeah. one that James Saints, if I remember, Quentin, years and years ago. No, I don't oh. think I had it then. I've only ever had one, it was the one I got from Don. Oh, I thought you brought <laughs> one in. It was no good, so I just put it on. I thought you um, brought one in. Um, I'll knife you in a minute. <laughs> oh, it would have been around about. Oh. No, I've only ever had the one. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And everything Don said it did, it doesn't, so I got rid of it. Oh, stop. <laughs> You're still persisting with desert ash, and you know I can outgrow you with desert ash. I mean, the desert ash grow really nice up there. They get tiny little leaves where I am, whereas they don't down here. They look ridiculous down here. They're much better than my place. Ridiculous. Is that a fight in the stage? It's all love. <laughs> Do the parodies um, defoliate? Do you defoliate them to get smaller leaves? Oh, yeah. In my climate, um, the most, six times in the season. <laughs> six. I had the leaves on, and full crop. Uh, that's a lie. Five times full crop. The last time I did it, I was very excited and I was drinking. And I, uh, yeah, I started to thin it out a bit and I thought, you know, you cut the leaves by 
you take two thirds of the leaf off. Mm -hmm. Seen that in Japan, they were they were cutting Zelkova, and they were cutting two thirds of the leaf away. And these little guys sitting there on the chairs are cutting these massive Zelkovas with a million leaves. And I started cutting two thirds of the leaf off, thinking that'll let them white through. The White's not a problem for me out there. It's like we do our we do our um, summer tidy up of the pines. Um, I was talking to a gentleman here tonight, and he does it in December, January, and I do mine February, March because we still get 40 degrees, so mm. it's all applicable. Um, I did the parodia, the last time I did the parodia, uh, for the sixth time, I got about two thirds of the leaf crop back. It was still a full leaf crop, but the inner buds didn't burst like I, and the reason you do that, I mean, the reason I did that was to see if I could do it, but you do it because your ramification increases unbelievably. You can get, each time they pop, you get a lot more bud burst, and you get a lot more little, and the extensions aren't very big, but once you've got your, if you've got a good trunk, you've got a good branch layout, it's really just ramifications what you take from then on. And so defoliation and multi-defoliation uh, gives you that within a couple of seasons. Each time you get a new crop of leaves on, it's really two seasons in one. So if you do it three times, I know you can do it in Melbourne at 72 to 78 Clarinda Road, South Clayton, which is where Ted was, you can do that three times. And in fact, his autumn show, the Waverley used to do an autumn show, and his parodias had spring growth on them. Because that was the first time I ever seen them was at the Waverley show. Yeah, so, yes, a good thing to defoliate. How many times have you and Quentin did demos together? I try not to work with him, he's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Too many times. Too many? Too many times. <laughs> I think Quentin's assisted everybody, like, you know, hundreds of times. Like, every time Hero used to come out, uh, at the end of that, I would, I would, occasionally I would luckily get down for Hero uh, workshops and, and see the demonstration of that, and I always enjoy them, because he was, uh, the guy's mad, he's got a sense of humour, like, he's, he's good. Um, but Quentin and Steve would do lots and lots of, you know, very selflessly help all the, and get like 3,000 workshops for nothing <laughs> every week or so. It was just, yeah, so I mean, the way you grow is to do the stuff. That's, the, you know, the way you get better at anything is to do it. Um, that's why I'm so in the wing. <laughs> I just do it all the time. But yeah, so, um, and Quentin's always helped me out. Um, but even, Privately, we did a um, we did a we had a bit of a catch up about three weeks ago oh, yes. here in Melbourne. We we um, we did a little bit of work together. Uh, Steve, um, Brian, you, Brian, yeah, man's a legend. Yep, absolute legend. He was very very good to us. He fed us. <laughs> I highly recommend going to his place. <laughs> Anybody wants his address, come and see me after the thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 No, but yeah, no, we had, a, we had an absolute ball. It was a great day, um, and, and and it was just it was just uh, practicing a bit of technique, learning a bit of new technique, trying to get a bit more out of things. Everything's about you know the learning curve. As you get older, uh, you have less time to to um, learn some things, and um, I'm 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 made out of rubbish, so I'm not going to have a real long time. I want to make sure I go into the ground with as much info as I can as I can squeeze in. So when you get people that are prepared to teach you, and I mean, Buffett here is pretty good. He, um, <laughs> fairly giving. Um, Only if there's something coming back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got a coach. <laughs> Jesus, honestly. I'll feed you after. Yeah. yeah, so, but that's the thing. Like, there's, a, there's another gentleman here in the room with the cuttings. There. Bumped into him, we had a conversation a couple of years ago on the phone. Um, I just, I seen his number on a public toilet, I thought I'd ring it. Um, <laughs> that's actually a lie. Uh, <laughs> that's just a bald face lie. Uh, we were talking about uh, black pine air layer. Uh, tonight, we had a very productive conversation uh, about black pine cuttings. And he's having quite good success. And he's got about as much, 
technology sort of um, in it. So you don't need to have, you know, um, shares in Sage with, you know, heated tents and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and he's getting a good result. So you, you share the information around and anything that you tell somebody else, even though you give up the secret, what you do is you give them the opportunity to take that idea and run with it and maybe come up with an even quicker way of doing things. Mm -hmm. now, anybody who's a reader, and I used to be a reader, um, not anymore, because now everything's available on YouTube, you can get it all delivered in a format and there are even some of those um, channels are pretty good. Uh, you still have to, you still have to um, adapt the timing for your location. But um, if you read the, the bond, like if, you, if you've gone through the bonsai the days and then they've turned into bonsai focus, some of the masters, you know, well, in inverted corners masters, that were doing cutting edge stuff back in the early 90s and then all the way through, you'll often see some of the stuff that they've styled once get styled again by another master and it's even more amazing. And everybody's learning, everybody's improving, everybody's practicing. And as a result of that, the product is getting better and better. Hopefully it's getting better. And even the, the, the end result, to get to that end result is faster, which is what we all want to do, because none of us are going to live forever. Quint thinks he is, but he won't. Um, so anything you give away, you're not, you get it back. Somebody, it might not be the person who you gave it to, but you've got a, Tom's a bloke. Over the years I've interacted with Tom, oh Jesus, heaps of times, Bendigo, uh, golf fields, all that sort of thing there. And Tom's always sort of giving information away. And um, I don't think anybody's hurt by it. Like you, you, the only, the only, the worst thing that can happen is you hear that somebody's keeled over before you found out. Like there's a guy in hay, and he's he's in hay days, which is a, a retirement thing there, and he's a, an Italian guy, and he's got a salami recipe that you would just not believe. It's it's unbelievable. I've been trying to get that recipe for about five years. Now I'm typical dog. I make salami every June long weekend. We just do that. Um, Sam Borgia. Sam's mix is unbelievable. It's just it's a proper calabrese mix. It's magnificent. He's got no kids that he'll own up to, and he will not tell anyone. And the guy's like 900 years old, and he's, spoon -fed, and he's gonna die, and this recipe's gonna go with it. For what? You know, just for what? And eventually somebody will stumble across that combination of things, but yeah, he's not gonna give it up. Now, I, I just see that as just sad, really. He's probably forgotten it. Oh, no, 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 no. No, that side of him, that side of him's okay. Just, I just don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. I teach pottery, and uh, I pass on all the techniques I know. My students come to you with a problem, you try to solve it with them. They go away and do what you suggest. You take it and do what you want to do. They're two totally different things. They come back together, and you've got a new technique. Yeah. It's, yeah. And I've, I've never eaten anything, definitely. Never said nothing. This is private, this is wrong. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. Always passed it off. Um, well, I, no, I was going to do, you see if I'll do that? Uh, or, I don't think Dave should do that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, okay, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to let you walk away now. I was going to work out that. <laughs> so you've already cut off what you, oh, what no. you wanted? Or? No, no, no. We're going to do the, the big timber thing. and yeah. No, there's a lot more to come off. But like I said, the, the image... The image I want to try and create, which is going to be interesting when they see the other thing. You don't have to think outside the box when you see part two. Um, and in fact, if there's time for a drinkies, something just, you know, two things of scotch might, mm -hmm, might, might make it make sense. Um, like I said, it's a high mountain scene tree. Uh, it's going to have been absolutely bollocked by everything that comes over the, the edge of the cliff. Um, and so there's going to be a fair bit of dead wood on it. And given the fact that the, the main part of the trunk is, is massively, a third of it, 
was gone, basically. Um, yeah, so there's going to be a fair bit of dead in the lower part, which we'll um, position and try and make a bit of sense out of. Um, but yeah, so there's a bit more to come off. All right, where's the, where's, 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 where's the, where's the, where's the, When, when you're doing it with, with, when you keep your rolls like this, what happens is Quentin comes along, he'll just cut anywhere. Oh, you're right. Don't go fishing with him. <laughs> he says, I'll have a piece. I went to cut a piece off and that just came out of it. You've had this. This was you. This was not me. You just can't kick with your. So how about um, conifer species then, favourite? Favourite conifer species? Um, black. But I had a, um, a botanical garden in probably the early 90s. We had 130 different varieties of things. I was propagating like a lunatic in those days and we were selling stuff to Sweeney, um, Ted, Simon, um, the problem was that they looked okay for, for most of the year, but then summer would come along. And I learned very, very quickly, the best thing to do is grow the things in your climate that require the least amount of your effort after you've addressed all of the main things, water, fertility, sprays for pests. Uh, so I grow about six different varieties of things. As soon as I backed away from, I think I had four or five different types of cotonia uh, to microfilla and thymophilias. And um, I, I, could, I had cotoniasters in berry all year round. I had a species that had a, because berry starters sell better than non berry starters. So when you're selling the, so I had that sort of thing. In the end, I, I stopped doing that um, and just grew the things. So I grew ash, elm, uh, a couple of different types of elms, corky bark, uh, the one from the Hay Hospital, which is probably one of the best Chinese elms in the country. It's a magnificent tree. Uh, I grow uh, cuttings off that and seed and variegated elm, uh, Chinese elm as well. I grow, so there's three different types of elms. Black pine, red pine, parodia, um, bougainvillea. I'm now starting to play with those. They like the heat. So yeah, lots of, lots of just the smaller ones. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, there's figs there as well, because I used to sell figs to uh, Sweeney and he used to sell them from Bunnings and I stopped doing that because you'd go into Bunnings and you'd see, not your own stuff, but you see, you think, I go into Bunnings, I see the way they keep their bonsai and I go, oh, Good. it's like you may as well just, and I thought, I'm contributing to this, so I stopped doing it. I, yeah, so I felt better about it and not doing it, but yeah. Um, so yeah, about half a dozen varieties and that's enough. Uh, but the pines, I like to play, because I know so little about pines. Uh, in the scheme of things, because like I said, you know, whatever you think you know now is a definitive, in three or four years' time, somebody's going to go, no, oh, I don't do that. When I, when I prune my summer stuff off my pines, I take that stuff as cuttings and it strikes. <laughs> and you go, what? And yeah, somebody's done something and it's worked and you, um, something you didn't think was possible, somebody's not only tried but they've succeeded and they're doing it, so yeah. So there's a long way to go with pines. Hugh's got it down pretty well, Pat. He's, he's mm -hmm. pretty good with pines. I hate to give him a compliment, but yeah. A long way to get that. Yeah, 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 no, no, yeah, no, that's going to get an absolute point. <laughs>
John, you talked about you grew a lot of stock or you grow stock. I still grow a lot of stock. So any tips, some key tips for people if they want to try and grow their own stock? Just a couple oh, look, of key I, things. I've got to be honest, the best thing you can do is grow your own stock. And I say that as somebody who's sold lots and lots of trees and you know, oh yeah, but if you if you know if you tell people they grow stuff, then you don't sell them anything. Well, <laughs> bullshit. Because I grow stuff that other people don't grow, and they grow stuff I don't grow. And and then they grow something so prolifically. I see one of them and think, oh, that's magnificent, and then I can get one of them because they've got 47. So to me, the most important thing to do is grow your own stock, be very, very realistic about your climate. Like I said, I had 130 different varieties of trees and I was, gonna, I was determined I'm gonna grow them in hay in New South Wales. You know, the, the land time forgot. Um, awful place, stinking hot, quite cold, not freezing cold, like um, so probably cold. Um, so yeah, it, it's one of those things where, where if, and I, every time there was a demo or a workshop, if I wanted to go into a workshop with somebody, I'd come to Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Adelaide, wherever the thing was, I'd get there the day before maybe, I couldn't afford to go a month before, go to one of the nurseries, find a nice piece of material to take to the workshop. And do it. So in the end, I got sick of going and looking at all the stuff that had been pulled over, I started growing stuff. I was very lucky, we had like 30 acres, uh, the family had a farm and I was given a portion of the farm to grow stock, so I did. And um, as a result of that, after about two or three years, I had stuff in the paddock, even though by today, by the standards that I keep stuff now, it was rubbish compared to the stuff I've got now, but it was still better than the stuff I was buying. And I was able to show up with multiple of things. I did a first time I ever worked with Hero, I worked with him in Sydney, um, BFA, got, uh, yeah, BFA. Got him in Sydney. <coughs> I did a group of parodias on a slate, and uh, he wanted to know what I was going to do. I, I said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to find. And he goes, um, Okay, how many trees do you want to do? I said, Oh, do you want to pick out some trees? And he said, Oh, if you like. So we went out to 10, and there was 80 in the back of the band to choose from. <laughs> we chose 10, because one of them had twin trunk, and looked like <coughs> number 11. And I got a magic group out of it. Um, and and I'd have never been able to do that had it not been, you know, the fact that I was actually able to grow the stuff. So, yeah, look, it's grow stuff, anything that you grow in your yard, grow it. The small stuff can be done into little groups, um, and then as they develop, you can tear the groups apart and redo them, and you end up with nice little trees, but you can swap with other people. Uh, you'll find as you get older, smaller trees make more sense, they do. You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, on, on hernia operation number 47. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like so, yeah, like, the most important thing is take lots and lots of cuttings, grow lots and lots of seed, and then be generous. When it germinates, give it, hand it around. You come to the, you, I'm 300 k's to the nearest club, and my nearest club is Bendigo, and I was actually quite an active member of the Bendigo club for a long time, but it's 600 k's round trip for the day. So, it, you know, it makes it a bit of a, so when I'd go, I'd take stuff and you just do, you know, because like you'd have lots of stuff. So, yeah, don't be, some people are going to have bigger yards than others, but grow lots of stuff um, and be generous, you know. And there's training tables. I mean, you yeah, know, it's there. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad way to, to approach the hobby. Okay, so I better, you're not going to, I thought you were going to stop it. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, but yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, it land up at your place. I'm not taking it home with stock. How am I going to take it home when it's like. Yeah, okay. okay. I, need, uh, I need that. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah. Don't remind me what I'm going to do. Well, I deliberately put it oh. on the right way. Well, you say that. 
then again, you did cut into that thing there. Four cut. That was you. That was you. you did that. No, I put an extra piece on there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I like about you? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Now that is a very good question. You're impatient though. No, that is, but, that, but, that is, but that's what you've got to ask. See, how do you fix the problem of the thing being like that? Well, see, kidneys. See, my ma didn't raise no idiots. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> Quite a few of us, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, that is, that's the dilemma. You know, like, I don't want this tree to come out of a pot on an angle like that because, it, you know, it's not, there's so much material lends itself to that. It, 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 the little uh, tuga there, the little hemlock in the middle, I highly recommend you chew on some of the foliage. Um, <laughs> it comes out of very, lots of dead wood at the top and, and the, the evidence of all sorts of nasty crap thrown at that tree over the years when it was up the side of the mountain and it, it grew down and it, that tree as an extreme drop you can do it, but it doesn't really warrant it. It looks like it's growing out, maybe, maybe a big crescent or whatever, you know, maybe a little bit of protection further along the trunk and something underneath, but as an extreme drop, no. So that's a good tree, that's a good pot, and it's a very nice pot actually, by the way. It's, um, it's a real freestyle pot, really bizarre. Those, well, I don't think they came, but they weren't um, out of a mould or anything, they would have been handmade. Um, so it, the whole thing is nice and rugged and all the rest of it, it paints the right, uh, the picture for that scene, high mountain scene as well. But when you start going further, the fact that the tree comes out of the ground a little bit and then goes over, it gives you that possibility. This thing is sideways. It's you know, if I take the soil out of here, when I hang the thing up, if I take the soil out of here, um, which I which I will do, there's, it's not really going to kick it out away from the pot. So I had to come up with a way of, of doing it so that it would. So that we resolve that issue when you see what I made. And now I'm going to get, they're going to stone me when I leave here. They're going to, what the hell did we just see? But it was the only way I could resolve the issue. And I didn't want to just, I didn't want to do a raft. How many people have gone to a workshop and somebody says, oh, that'll make a good raft? And you go, yeah, no, that potentially it would. And then in 50 years' time, somebody brings that raft back in and goes, it's finally taken roots. <laughs> If I was going to do a raft on this, what I would do is I would actually drill lots of holes along the trunk, seriously, and I would plant, uh, I would put little tiny seedling black pines in because I've got hundreds of them, 
and I'd let them grow and fuse or approach graft onto the side and you would actually have roots. And in fact, another Ted Jim, he would have styrenes and he would, um, he would have lots of seedlings. He'd go down to Frank Lucas's and he'd buy seedlings by the bundles. And he would put the, he'd actually cut a slot in the side of the styrene, full size styrene, put soil in there up to, the, up to that slot and then he'd poke the seedlings through the slot and they'd grow out of the soil. I know, see, look at that in your face. I did the same thing when I said, mm. then, then, he'd backfill up, you just poked all the loose through the seedlings in there, so you grow hundreds of little seedlings. Chinese elms, Japanese maples, tried maples. Put them all through the thing there, and then you just let them grow. And then they just grow mm, and grow up. And then in the following winter, uh, late winter, uh, getting close to the spring, he would take them out and all the roots would come out and go one way and then you could actually put them on the side of a trident maple or a Japanese maple that didn't have roots on one side and you could just graft them into the side and you, had, you could improve the root system. So it's a lot of dicking around but at the end of the day, how do you fix it? Oh, well you can score the side of the thing and then hug the lady upstairs or the bloke upstairs goes, yeah, you've been a good boy, I'll put some roots on there for you. It doesn't happen. Like it doesn't happen very often. So. Um, you have to come up with all sorts of different ways to resolve issues that just happen naturally. And so, yeah, a few things like that that work, that work quite well. Okay, but this one, yeah, the problem with this one here, yeah, when you see the, when you, when you see the container, yeah, yeah you'll, you'll understand, maybe you'll understand. And you'll go, I should have stayed home and watched Neighbours. Well, he says you'll understand, but I, um, <laughs> I actually thought it was a hard rubbish collection when I uh, <laughs> first saw it. Now, see. <laughs> We're going to see it tonight? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I'll send, I want everybody's phone number. I'll send it as a picture and a text. No. <laughs> <laughs> They won't, it won't hurt this time of the year, given how much, given I'm not touching the roots at all. Yep. Um, it's no different than any of the trees out in the nature strip today. They've got an absolute bollock and lost a branch or whatever, and they'll bounce back, you know, to a certain degree. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Are they more flexible this yeah. time of year? Or? A big pun. Are they more flexible this time of year? Yeah, well, they're, you're, on the, you're on the up uh, surge of the sap. Uh, yep. They're just about to flower. Uh, it's a good thing it's not any more advanced, otherwise, you're going to see up into the dust. But um, yeah, no, it's, they're quite, yeah, they're, they're really without any supportive wire. Yeah. Now that's not broken, that's yeah. probably trying to knock it. No, broken yeah. there. But yeah, like that's, yeah. you know, for styling it. Yeah, ideal. Right, yeah. Broken another one. <laughs> don't break, don't hit them that far. That was an example of what not to do. Um, propagation. Yeah. But most of the things that go wrong with propagation is timing. Yeah. When's the best time? The old age. When's the best time to take a cutting of that particular variety? When you're walking past with scissors, and if you take enough cuttings at one or two times of the year, you're going to find you're successful. Uh, you don't have to do. Not everything has to be learned um, the hard way, because there's so much stuff. <laughs> How many people in this room have grown seedlings or cuttings? Okay. Uh, how many people in this room have conversations around the bar up there? I mean, this is an amazing stuff. You've got a bar there. I walked in there was a bloke drinking a beer. I thought, I've died to go to heaven. There's trees and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so how often do you sit around together and discuss what you do? Absolutely, you don't. You don't. What's wrong with you? Mm. I'm up there. The good thing I'm schizophrenic, but I have no one to talk to. <laughs> like, you've got to, you've got to, um, the people that aren't doing a lot of it need and want to do it need to be guided to a certain degree and even if somebody gives you a real bum steer and it, it might be a bum steer for you because where you are you're, you're 
geography is very, very uh, important. I can grow most things where I am, and if I was to come here and say, look, the best thing to do with that particular tree at this time of the year is this, or that, it'd be bollocks. Um, some are tidy up for, um, for like when you do your pine uh, trimming, your summer trimming here, is December, January. December, yeah. Okay, uh, when, Bowie, when Grant Bowie was doing it in Yerrimville up near Sydney, in, uh, just out of Mittagong, I was already field growing, and he used to come out very, very regularly. He set up his place because you could see the results I was getting just by putting stuff in the ground and running a bit of water out to it. So he started doing that, and then he started doing his pine tidy ups, which I and I thought, okay, well, I got mine doing. I would start doing the same thing, but I'd get juvenile regrowth because I'd be doing it at the same time, but it was too early for me, and it was like nearly five weeks too early for me because then, at like. The following year, I did it probably two weeks later. It took about three years to get it right. So even, uh, admittedly, that's just about 600 k's different. But the reality is, from where I am, you come 120 k's south, it's three degrees difference. From Hayter to Nilligan, it's three degrees. It's cooler there in summer and cooler there in, in winter. Um, and so as you descend then, when you get down here, it doesn't work anymore because then you get closer to the coast. Now where Steve Jarrell is down at, um, near Frankston, he's never had frost down there. Um, so, so then there's a whole other sort of thing you've got, to, uh, you've got to deal with. So when people say, how do you do this, how do you do that, I can tell you how I prep my cuttings. Uh, I can tell you what, you know, what I soak them in, pre-soak them. I tell you what I um, sow, like I always pre-soak seed overnight. It always gets a, a soak overnight. And if anyone's ever grown dope, and don't take this the wrong way, but that seed, um, it'll soak overnight, it'll go to the bottom of the, the glass. I've only ever grown it for friends. I've never mm. used any of that, I've never been half. Um, <laughs> God, I was on fire the other day. Uh, no, that's a joke. Um, if you don't pre-soak them, the germination time is, is a, a couple of weeks difference from where I am, just with that. So sitting it in a glass of water overnight is the difference with it. Now, pine, I do pine and dope seed. Honestly, you can plant them in the same thing and they'll break ground at the same time. The ones that get the funny leaves, they're not pine. <laughs> they're not even maples. Uh, there's no police in the audience. <laughs> there's a lot of coppers in there. Oh, a lot of coppers. <laughs> I didn't inhale. Um, no, look, it really comes down to the pre-prep. When it comes to cuttings, um, deciduous trees, hardwood cuttings, dead of winter, the coldest time, take them then, take reasonable cuttings. Parati you take, you take quite large cuttings. Elms, you can take quite large cuttings off. Graham Beatty in Bendigo strikes Japanese maples from cuttings, like good size cuttings. I've never struck a Japanese maple from a piece of wood, ever. I've grown thousands of them from seed. Um, but he can't grow trident maple from cutting, and I can grow them from cutting. Same, same practice he does. So it's all about, he's doing cuttings where he is, and he lives close to you, and so you say, well, what was your success rate with this? You can try to, and even when you get all that right, the bloke upstairs says, this year I'm going to give you an average winter, or I'm going to give you a severe winter, and that has an effect. It all comes down to doing it again and again and again. But every time you cut something off a tree that you've bought, and you strike it, okay, it, it, it reduces the original cost. You've then, like, and eventually the tree, those 32 cuttings I got off Ted, gave <laughs> me a huge amount of money. I've never spent any of it on drugs or alcohol. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So um, everybody who's doing cuttings here, who's growing seedlings at the moment, or seed at the moment? Collected the seed in the autumn digits or over the winter or okay. Any success so far? The ground heaving and breaking yet? Just mine aren't yet, yeah. Good, good. You've got I, uh, I was I grew my fruit trees. Yes. And I've got a big bunch of cuttings and I left them two or three weeks in the water. Mm -hmm. They're blossoming now, the shoots you know, are coming out. Yeah, water. yeah, yeah. And now yesterday I've planted them. Yeah, no, they'll, they may fail. For me, they would fail where I am uh, because it's going to... We've got 31, 30 and 31 Friday, Saturday, where I am. So anything that bolts uh, into leaf before it's calloused. I'll give you, for instance, I used to graft a lot of deciduous trees, maples in particular, and I'd collect the, the wood that I was going to graft. I'd usually be up in the hills here somewhere and somebody'd have a really unusual form of uh, maple that I quite liked. 
The first ones we've seen parking, so they're coral larks. So I'd go and cut chunks off people's trees, and then I'd take them home, I'd wrap them up in damp newspaper, put them in a plastic bag, take them home, stick them in the crisper, and that'd be June. They'd stay in the crisper until August, September. And then I'd take them out of the crisper, and then the seedling Japanese maples I'd be growing would be active, and I could then graft onto them with dormant signs. The little mm. pieces I've got to put on would be sound asleep. They'd be in the fridge at three degrees. And then do it that way. Anything that I left too long by September, October, the stuff in the crisper would have actually callused, and I'll have really knobbly white bits at the, the cup, at the base of the thing, like they're callousing ready to strike. Mm. Every time that happened, and it was a infamous with um, crab apples. I grew up, used to grow a lot of crab apples, uh, a little graft of the crab apples. They all did it, none of those would strike for me. Bowie used to strike the bloody things if he didn't rake them up. They'd just strike up where he was. So, same thing. And no, 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 no. Look, plant them. I'll plant them. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good. They, they definitely won't strike if you don't plant them. <laughs> yeah. They definitely won't be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got to do it. Now, now, if they fail, if they fail, next year when you prune the things, will you be a bit more keen? Will you be keener to get them planted a bit earlier? Yeah. Well, then it won't be a failure, will it? You've learned. That, that's the and thing. I did have a car seeds too. Okay. And they got the shoots. You'll be going if you can bonsai an avocado. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely come around and prune for you. <laughs> that's good, man. Yeah, yeah, that's good enough. Question. Question. Why didn't you debark it before you put on the wall? Yeah, we should. <laughs> we should. Oh, yeah. Now, now uh, can I ask, why didn't you say that before? <laughs> Everyone's clever in mind, so I don't know. You've got to see what he's done. I'll never be able to use that wire, and he's chipped the crap out of the wire. Oh, there'd be no unfurling that. And he cut the other, did I tell you about he cut the other wire? Yeah. <laughs> oh, did I mention that? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so, the wire. so this is this is where we're at at the moment, and all I've got to do now is just position the branches um, to try and make some you sense of it. Do I? You want to sit on the little seat I've brought in for you? Yeah. <laughs> So you'll get a punch in the kidneys in a minute, mate. I thought that, I thought that little stand for a seat for him, but he reckons he's not going to sit on it. You can sit down and do it. When he wasn't on it. If I wanted people to take the urine out of me, mate, I'd have stayed in hate. There's a vast population of people there wanting to do that. So you're going to try and do it Yeah, I'll try and do it sort of looking. See, Don, you're going to start putting in place, yeah. are you? Yeah. I'll yeah. give the guys a 10 minute break while yeah, I have coffee and then we'll come back to it. Yeah, no, that'd be fine. Well, that, that way I can actually put it back to you, which is yeah. much prettier. Yeah. yeah. I'll just, yeah, look that here. Yes. That. Yes. 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 Y
Yeah. Another five minutes, I reckon, Dave. Yeah. Another five minutes, good minutes, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you bring that. It's going to be difficult to see it from the back, so you're walking up that walk. Oh, you got so it's not going to be difficult to see it from the back because you've got technology. I come from the Stone Age. Um, it's the first set, so on the first wiring, and given the constraints of the time, it, it, look, it's it's one bloke. It's an all afternoon job if you're on your own, uh, to, you know, and you would gin the branches before you would um, wire. Like yes, sorry, yes, yes so. Because I'm a lot cleverer at home than I am here. Um, so yeah, given given how much time we've had, which we've had plenty of time, but it's taken two of us, and given the fact that he actually goes okay for an old bike, um, we've got it at this level. The wiring, you're going to see all sorts of things of wiring, it'll get changed and whatever, like over the, over the coming week or whatever. Most of the trees that you do in the demonstration, you've got to go home and you've got to go, geez, why did I do that? But like, we're not making excuses, but you can only do so much in a session. Yeah. So we've got it roughed out. What will happen now is as the thing extends, for me, it'll start to shoot out. I'll, all the flowers will go. I'll give it a couple of weeks and then I'll nip all those off because uh, within the next couple of weeks the flowers will open, there'll be pollen everywhere, I'll nip all those candles back and then they'll get a little bit of back bone. So that'll develop between now and, and Christmas and then I'll have a lot more. Um, I'll have a lot more foliage to play with. The other thing is too that the new position that it'll now be in will mean that the foliage that comes over the coming uh, couple of months will reorient with up. So the needles will face up. At the moment, they're sort of all over the shop. Um, but considering the tree up until a while ago lived its life like that. Now, yeah. Quentin said that what I had to do was I had to, he said, now at the end, he said, turn it upside down, so it's an upright. <laughs> now, he sees an upright in that, and you think I do drugs. So, yes. so now, to resolve the issue of the, um, of the pot, Quentin, would you get the one I talked to you earlier? So I was, I had a heap of um, off cuts of pipe, just different sized bits of pipe, and a gas bottle. And so, we cut the bum off the gas bottle, cut. So, and then, then I made a wire mesh, well, I had six mil, or five mil. Yeah, put it up on the thing, do I? Now this will just goes that way. This will rust like mad. Look, I finished it last last night in the shed, and I didn't have time to rust it. So I'll spray it with um, yeah. white vinegar and bleach, uh, a little bit of salt in there as well, and it'll rust literally overnight. But I was a bit knackered last night, so I didn't get around to doing it. Um, then you put, uh, I'll put that on the outside. I'll get a couple of these. I'll cut them, and what I'll do is I'll cut up the shape there, and then I'll use the thinnest wire I've got, and I'll twitch around the edges and I'll stitch it on. You think, yeah, that's going to be a bit. I can grow all sorts of house leeks on that, uh, all sorts of little gra uh, like grasses and things like that, just succulent type stuff. And this, what I have to do, which I didn't have a chance to do last night, I'll notch in here. And when this is actually put in, it'll just drop straight down. Now, to display uh, for more of an arty sort of thing, I suppose, it's not traditional bonsai, and, and obviously you can now tell that uh, drugs have factored heavily in my life, um, <laughs> and will continue to do so. Um, yeah, it was the only way I could sort of come up with, with putting a thing into a, into a setup where even if there's a show somewhere, and I wanted to just, the whole thing is one go. You just plonk the thing there, and it's done. So that's maybe not to everybody's liking, but the reality is, you're on, it's not as out there as some of the stuff I've seen. In 2000, I was at the Blackson Conference Centre and they did um, corrugated iron tin and old rusty tin, they planted things on that and that was the Australian theme. And um, I think there was a bloke, there's a bloke in the thing here who probably would have went to that as well. Is he? Yeah, he would have. Did you go to the Blackson in 2000? At the AABC conference, Ian? Where were you? Yeah. There. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. So the, they had um, 
wall bales and straw and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, it's just something to sort of consider. Um, but yeah, the whole thing's got to be naturalised that. And once this is rusted up, I mean, it'll go the same. It'll look a whole lot more. And then if it doesn't work, it's always hard rubbish though. <laughs> yeah. So that was, yeah, that's basically, and I'll take it through the steps and put it in and see if it works. I'll have to line it with plastic, clearly, because it'll breathe too much for where I am. But um, I can't see there being a major problem with horticulturally with it done, with it growing. So that yes. That looks awesome. Well, it's different. That looks, no, that looks and, I, and, I, and I like the fact that I actually made the pipe straight. I sort of measured my arm and I went, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. So, so, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> yeah. So, that is, yeah, that's the, like, like, yeah, if you, if you can, yeah, you're taller than me. <laughs> See what could go wrong. <laughs> Somehow she's going to sit in there. Yeah. When, when you look at how much soil will come off the top, yeah. uh, I'll comb the roots out. It'll be next season. I'll be able to get, because I don't want to remove any of the roots that are growing in the upper part of that now, but what I'll do is I'll comb the roots out and, and I'll bend them around because they'll be quite flexible. Uh, there's no, I mean, why that's a risk. They'll just comb them out and be able to be formed around and the soil can go quite high in the, in the thing, uh, you know, as, I, as they often do in the crescent pots. Um, so I can't see any major horticultural problems. Aesthetically it might be offensive, but as long as it's horticulturally it works. Uh, it'll be something sits in the back of a the nursery and the tree will develop a little bit more from what it was. So there you go. A glimpse into my mind. <laughs> is there any thoughts that you might link the shari with the gin or is that going to cut the live vein to the, the rest of it too much? Initially, initially you'll just leave it to dry out. Uh, they'll, look, the gins will need to be placed a little bit more over the coming days while it's still supple enough to do it because you've got to refine all that sort of stuff. Then the gins themselves on the end, once they're dried out enough, or you can even silk carve now, which is just pulling back the, the, um, the threads one at a time, which if you don't have power tools and things like that, you can, and in fact, power tools are a great way to shortcut things, moving bulk, but you always get a better look on, on refined um, dead wood if you do the silk. So you, I think what Rebecca was asking. Yeah, about that. Through there. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, but, um, yeah down, down the track, yeah. The thing is though, that to do that in a, in a sense where if you were to make a hole, hollow it out to go through, uh, if that's what you were thinking, if, there's no reason why you couldn't, but aesthetically, why would, why would you bother? No, I'm not just linking the gin with the shark. Oh, you mean going around the side? But yeah, look, it's, it's as possible, as but when you look at the, when you look at it, it's, it's rolled up. Oh, because that's quite, yeah, that's quite, yeah, and on this, on this side of there, it's a bit, it's not as aggressive. There's a really big, thick, wide vein around that yeah. side. Uh, it, down the track, you could do it, if, and if aesthetically it made the tree better for it, you'd do it. But um, I'd wait a bit uh, because it's yeah it's it's been through a bit tonight. It's nearly thrown off stage. <laughs> That's usually me. <laughs> so thank you very much for sitting through it all and for coming out on a night like tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sick plants. You nurture sick plants. You nurse them back into health. Uh, so you use um, well a lot of the more passive. Fertilizers. I use um, Prill Urea a lot. Its NPK ratio is 278.00, so there's a lot of nitrogen. Um, I put um, blood and bone into everything. Um, uh, I mix up, one of my favourite mixes is um, by, by equal parts blood and bone, five kilos of blood and bone into a bucket, um, five kilos of citrus fertilizer, the Brunnings brand. Uh, or any of those cheapy ones you get at Bunnings. They usually come on special, so I buy whichever one I go to Griffith and get the stuff. 50-50 um, of that, or this. Um, uh, that goes on everything. I mean everything. I use a lot of Dynamic Lifter because it's a, a good organic buffer, so it, you don't get too much salt buildup, which you get from synthesised fertilisers. Um, Osmocote, slow release is fantastic. Um, but I use, it, it says, like it, with, I used to have to work out the ratios per square metre. 
because I was because I'm in a farming district, I can actually buy. Well, my mate gets eight ton of pearl urea at a time, so I go and get buckets of the stuff. Uh, so if you're just getting a little bit of your fertilisers, if I get any of the composted um, cottonseed trash, which is really really good as well. All sorts of things. Everything's in massive. Uh, amounts for me, so I mix things up in buckets or, or drums. But if you're doing stuff like um, Osmocote, where they have a recommended amount, and then you'll read it in an obscure passage, somebody that says, feed your sick plant or feed your plants half strength this in the first three months, it's bullshit. Feed your plants. If you don't believe in that, then go home tomorrow and have half your dinner. And do that for three or four days and see if it works. It's, if you've got a sick plant, like anything else, you change the position of it, you nurture, uh, nurse, you know, nurture it back to health, and then but when you're feeding, you, I don't feed sick plants because nine times out of ten, the nitrogen component in the thing will burn off all the roots. So if the plants are ha happy and healthy coming out of a, a winter dormancy, and in fact, Ted, uh, another one, another plug for Ted. Ted fed all year round. And I said, why are you feeding in the middle of winter? They're not doing any growing. He said, because in the spring, he said, they, um, I don't have to remember, they just kick away. And he used to get phenomenal growth out of stuff because he was growing stuff to sell. As soon as it was saleable, the big, and as big as he could get it, as quick as he could get it, he could sell it. So look at what nurseries do. We were talking about it, and, and he made a very, very valid point today. He said, said um, he puts slow release uh, Osmoco into everything at, at planting time. And he said nine times out of 10 he can get through the whole season just by doing that. And he said, I, he studied that, I think I'm paraphrasing, studied what nurseries were doing. Nurserymen are there to make a dollar and they don't do anything that wastes money. So if they're putting fertilizer in at the time of potting, it's because it will make, it'll give you a finished product much sooner. So yeah, look, look around, uh, talk much more amongst yourselves. I couldn't believe so many people were growing cuttings and seedlings in this audience and you just weren't talking to one another. The bloke up at the back there has got to go, how do you do that? You just need your asses kicked. Talk to one another, you know, share the information. You've just spent a fortune to get me here. This is $18 this is going to cost you that for you. Not, I'll give you the $18 in a minute, Dave. Um, but yeah, look, if you're going to get information from the idiots like me and, and you've got, you, you've got to talk to one another. You've got to visit one another's yards. You've got to let me visit your yards. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, um, you ever use ice crush eggs at my... Okay. I have eggs for breakfast, so I collect the cells, and I, I crush eggs. them. Put it all through your blend. I've got worm farm. Egg powder, egg powder. Yep. And I put them on for eggs. Yeah, yeah, with the calcium. Look, uh, they say you, can, you should yes. put citrus or... Yeah. or um, onion, garlic stuff, that in worm farms. And I don't, I don't buy, as a rule I don't. But with the eggs, I've got one of those little magic bullet things. Yeah. Because you can really mix ice and bourbon with that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I just put the eggshells in that and it, it turns into powder, what I talk about. And I sprinkle that, the worms, I'm not saying it makes them any better, but it doesn't hurt. And in fact, if you grow junipers, and here's one from Janet Sadie, who's knows her horticulture. Um, she was a mad juniper grower and ash and elm and all that sort of stuff in Adelaide. And she used to always put crushed eggshells in the potting mix when she was potting junipers. And I used to think uh, her junipers were the most lush, green, amazing, and she still got them and they still grow quite nicely. But that was her, and she, she would tell everyone, and people would go, oh, she's mad. But maybe they need that little bit of calcium. Maybe where they grow naturally. These were, <coughs> these weren't she parker, they were, um, Precumbers, yeah, precumbers. It's lush and green and didn't have that brown, like when you when you pluck them, they grow so vigorously you didn't have the brown tips on them, because you see some they look like they're scissor prune. But um, yeah, and so the calcium is good. Try on tobacco. Uh, Ted used to try, he used to grow tobacco, which is, which is illegal, but he used to grow the tobacco crops and he wasn't a smoker because he said tobacco as a plant responds so well to fertilizers, it'll tell you what it is missing in the fertiliser mix. So if it goes if it's a bit chloritic, if it needs more, more uh, molybdenum or whatever, iron, whatever, whatever is deficient, it will be, um, it'll be obvious on the leaf of the tobacco. You know, I don't know, I never, I've never grew, I used to smoke, but I've, I've never seen it green, so, so yeah. Um, dope's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks,